السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن جاءكم فاسق بنبأ فتبينوا فتبينوا أن تصيبوا قوما بجهالة فتصبحوا على ما فعلتم نادمين واعلموا أن فيكم رسول الله لو يطيعكم في كثير من الأمر لعنت ولكن الله حبب إليكم الإيمان ولكن الله حبب إليكم الإيمان وزينه في قلوبكم وزينه في قلوبكم وكره إليكم الكفر والفسوق والعصيان أولئك هم الراشدون فضلا من الله ونعمة والله عليم حكيم وإن طائفتان من المؤمنين اقتتلوا فأصلحوا بينهما وإن بغت إحداهما على الأخرى فقاتلوا التي تبغي حتى تتفيء إلى أمر الله فإن فات فأصلحوا بينهما بالعدل وأقسطوا إن الله يحب المقسطين إن إنما المؤمنون إخوة فأصلحوا بين أخويكم واتقوا الله لعلكم ترحمون صلق الله العظيم So the meaning of the verses that our beloved brother recited. O oh, you who have believed, do not put yourself before Allah and His Messenger, but fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is hearing and knowing. O oh, you who have believed, do not raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, or be loud to him in speech like the loudness of some of you to others. Lest your deeds become worthless while you perceive not. Indeed, those who lower the voices before the, the Messenger of Allah, they are the ones whose hearts Allah has tested for the righteousness. For them is forgiving and great reward. Indeed, those who call you, O oh Muhammad, from behind the chambers, most of them do not use reason. And if they had been patient until you 
until you could come out to them, it would have been better for them. But Allah is forgiving and merciful. O oh, you have who have believed, if there comes to you a disobedient one with information, investigate lest you harm a people out of ignorance and become over what you have done regretful. And know that among you is the messenger of Allah. If he were to obey, obey, obey you in much of the matters, you would be in difficulty. But Allah has endeared to you faith and has made it pleasing to, into your, in your hearts and has made hateful to, your, to you disbelief, defense and disobedience. Those are the right, rightly guided. It is as bounty from Allah and favor. Allah and Allah is knowing and wise. And if two factions among the believers should fight, then make settlement between the two. But if one of them oppresses the other, then fights against. The one that oppresses until it returns to the origins of Allah. And if it returns, then make the settlement between them in just, justice and act justly. Indeed, Allah loves those who act justly. The believers are but brothers, so make settlement between your brothers and fear Allah that you may receive mercy. Takbir. 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 So we're honored again, once again. The, uh, the title of today's discussion is Beyond Bilal, radiallahu an, the discussion of black Islam in the Islamic history. Uh, just to introduce Sheikh Mustafa Briggs. Sheikh Mustafa, he studied uh, his bachelor's and um, in, uh, master's in Arabic, in the language of Arabic. And then shortly after, he traveled in Mauritania and other places seeking knowledge of Islam. Currently, he is uh, studying at Al the prestigious Al-Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt. Um, one of uh, the way this book came about and the discussion came about is he used to give presentations on uh, the Islamic uh, history of black Islam. And from this, he published into his book and we're so honored and the books are in the back if you're interested um, as well. Um, the, other, the other announcement I wanted to make is we had a tragedy in our community. A few days ago, we lost uh, one of our own six-year-old daughters um, and, uh, um, and, his, and her mother is in the hospital, so pray for them. The janazah will be tomorrow. The funeral prayer will be tomorrow at one o'clock at Dhuhr time. We encourage everyone to come and join us uh, in this, inshallah. So I just wanted to make that announcement beforehand. Tomorrow is the janazah. She was one of our own youths that used to come and attend all of our activities. And subhanAllah, it was just a tragedy. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Imam Daud to lead this discussion. And as you all know, Imam Daud Walid is our executive director of care. He's one of our imams in the Muslim Michigan community. And he is a gem for our community. We're so blessed to have him here. And we'll ask Sheikh Mustafa as well to come up here as well. Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah al-Qa'il, ya ayyuhal nas, inna khadaqanakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ilan li ta'arafu, inna akramakum inda Allah yakakum, inna Allah alimu al-khabir. الحمد لله القائل إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت وبركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد. We begin with God's name, the most compassionate, the most merciful, the praise and thanks. Belongs to God, He who said in the Quran, 
O humankind, surely we created you from a single male, Adam, and a single female, Eve. And we made you in the different nations and tribes that you may get to know one another. And surely the most honorable of you of God are those of you who have the most mindfulness of God. And surely God is all-knowing and all-aware. And praise and thanks belongs to God who said in the Quran, Surely God and his angels send blessings upon the final prophet of God, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa O you who believe, send blessings upon him and salute him constantly with peace. And we ask Almighty God to bestow his blessings upon Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, just as he has sent blessings upon Abraham and the family of Abraham. So, uh, I'm very happy to have this discussion with uh, Sidi Mustafa Briggs, and uh, we're going to get right into it. Uh, I translated that for you in English, and I intentionally use the word God because I know that we have people in the audience who aren't Muslim, so at least from my end, I would try to keep the Arabic nomenclature to a minimum. And if we have to use any terms, at least on my end, uh, I will try my best to uh, translate or get uh, Sidi Mustafa to uh, bring you the English terms, uh, since a number of us are uh, not Muslims in the audience, so that we all can benefit uh, or get the maximum benefit, God willing. So uh, I've actually done some online programs with Sidi Mustafa before, yeah. and we've, our paths have, have crossed, and, uh, and we've also written about this same topic, but I'm really honored to be with my younger brother to have this discussion uh, this evening. So let's get right to it, uh, Sidi. You wrote this book, Beyond Bilal. So for those of you who aren't Muslims, know that Bilal is one of the saintly figures of the first generation of Muslims, and he has many merits. He was from uh, Abyssinian lineage or ancient Ethio Ethiopian lineage. Uh, he was the prayer caller for the, the Prophet oh, and for the community, the first. Uh, he also was uh, Khazan Beit al Mal, he was the Islamic treasurer, the first Islamic treasurer. Uh, he was a very courageous man. Uh, he even served as a bodyguard uh, and guarded uh, the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him. Some of so he has many uh, merits, uh, inwardly and outwardly. Uh, and he's one of the, the great African companions of the Prophet. Uh, so just to give you a little background. Now, you named this book Beyond Bilal, <laughs> which I know you're trying to convey something that uh, may be obvious to some of us who are, are black, <laughs> and, and are Muslim, but I'd like for you to like first just like, expound on why you named this book Beyond Bilal. Mm. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya ibn mursaleen. Alhamdulillah. So all praises due to Allah. It's a pleasure to be with you all here today. And um, as you said, we'll get right to it, inshallah. <laughs> After thanking the masjid for hosting us, alhamdulillah, and thanking everyone that came out to support and thank you, my big brother, alhamdulillah, Imam Dawood Walid, someone whose work I've followed for a very long time and who's served as a role model and an inspiration for me in what I'm doing as well, alhamdulillah. Um, essentially, the book is called Beyond Bilal because um, I was, how the book came about, it was the result of a presentation that I used to give of the same name, Beyond Bilal. And how I started giving the presentation or why I started giving the presentation was during my studies, I had studied Arabic and international relations as my bachelor's. I was studying translation of Arabic and Islamic texts as my master's. And I was invited to certain MSAs. There was a hot topic at the time around 2017 in the UK where I come from, hence the funny accent, around being black and Muslim. Because I had a friend that was interviewed on a national radio. And then at the end of the interview, someone said, the interviewer said to her, oh, you're Muslim? And she said, yeah. He's like, oh, but you're black. How, <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> because, you know, there was this ignorance around the presence of black Muslims. 
So that infuriated the black Muslims in the UK, and so there were a lot of conferences and speaking about the topic. And for me, when I was invited to speak, I didn't want to follow the trend of just complaining about my experience as a black Muslim. I wanted to actually provide some sort of education or some sort of information that could help progress the conversation beyond just complaining about racism or complaining about discrimination, etc. And so I gave a presentation and it was called Beyond Bilal, Black History and Islam. And why I called it Beyond Bilal was because for many Muslims and for many non-Muslims and for many black Muslims and non-black Muslims, the only significant black figure that they can name within the religion and the only contribution that they know when it comes to discussing black people within Islam is usually Bilal. And the story always begins with him and ends with him. And so there are many, for example, prophets mentioned in the Quran who were described either by the Quran itself or by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or by the early generations and the early scholars as being black that people are not aware of. There are many <coughs> Sahaba, more than 100, and you detailed them in Centering the Black Narrative, your first book, which was based on you know, the translation of the classical books of Ibn Jawzi and Suyuti on the subject. Over 100 black Sahaba that people don't know about or don't talk about, or if we do know them, we didn't know that they were black. And we'll go into that, I'm sure, in the conversation. And so I just wanted to highlight that there was more to the story than Bilal, and the story goes much deeper than Bilal, even though Bilal is, mashallah, he has his station, and it's a station that is an extremely high station amongst the companions and amongst all of the generations, but we need to stop tokenizing him and using him as a scapegoat when it comes to talking about the black presence within Islam. So that's why I decided to call the book Beyond Bilal. So in your deployment of this term, black, um, maybe some of us are thinking of like modern notions of race mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when they think of black, or maybe even confining, confining black to now what we would call the African continent. Mm. So I'd like for you to perhaps give a little explanation or answer a question about was there such a thing as blackness amongst medieval Arabs? I think that's a, a very important issue that needs some interrogation. Mm. So I feel as though you would be more appropriate to answer that question than me based on, mashallah, the research that you've done in your most recent book because the way that you address the subject, I haven't touched on the subject in that way. Um, which is that you go into the actual definitions of blackness, the terms of being black and how, you know, all of the... So I, I'll, I'll answer a bit and then I'll hand it back to you to give us the real answer, inshallah. But essentially, a lot of us think in modern day definitions of blackness that didn't exist in that time. And we categorize people according to, you know, new th theories and new categories that were essentially innovations when it comes to human thought. But Blackness has always just been, and the reason why I speak about black history in Islam is I don't speak of it in terms of race or sub-Saharan, people of sub-Saharan African descent only, but I speak of it in terms of blackness of skin. Because the definition of black according to different cultures, according to different societies always changes. And the definition of black, for example, in the UK where I am, and I always give this example, I'm black in the UK, I'm black British because I'm of African descent. But here in America, I was having a debate with my sister-in-law, who's half African-American, half Mexican. And she looks Arab, if you see her, or she looks what today they would define as Arab. And when I was in Mali, everyone thought I was an Arab too. <laughs> <laughs> and one day we were having a debate about something, and then she said, yeah, but you can't talk, you're not even black. <laughs> I said, how am I not black? I'm darker than you. And she said, no, 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 you're African, you're not black, it's different. So these are all different you know, notions and different ways people categorize. But for me, when I speak of blackness in the book, I speak of the skin complexion and I speak of darkness of color, which is something that exists in every single society. Most indigenous peoples and most ancient societies had dark skinned people in them. And unfortunately, anti-blackness is something that is a global phenomenon and it exists in every single culture and every single society. There is not, I recently read a study that there's not one language that doesn't have derogatory terms for people of darker skin. 
And that's something that you find in every culture. And that's something that the Prophet wasallam spoke out against in his time. That's something that he fought against amongst his companions. And that's something that he emphasized in his final Hajjatul Wada, his last speech that he gave to the, to the nation of Islam. And so that was what I wanted to discuss. And that's what I wanted to talk about. The fact that as Sheikh Ahmed... When he says nation of Islam, he doesn't mean what Farrakhan <laughs> leads you. No, the, the real, the original nation of Islam, <laughs> Ummat al Islamiyah. Uh -huh. um, and I wanted to just emphasize the same way, you know, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, for example, emphasized in his poetry, that darkness in skin complexion doesn't lead to uh, low intellect, it doesn't lead to all of these racist stereotypes and things that people have placed upon darker skinned people. Unfortunately, even within our own Islamic tradition, some of the scholars have anti black statements, some of the books have anti black sentiments, some of the fabricated hadith. All of these things were things that I wanted to kind of discuss in the book and lead people towards a better understanding of. And then I'll pass the question over to you to give us the real definitions, inshallah. Uh, just very briefly, um, the medieval Arabs n never saw blackness and Arabness as mutual exclusive identities. In fact, the Arabs themselves saw themselves as quasi-blacks. And I will just give you all an, a, a quick example and mention a couple of peoples very briefly. It's a well-known saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, I was sent to the red, literally. It's, it's, it's normally when you see English translations, it's translated as the white. I was sent to the white and the black. Um, commentators, this hadith, are unanimous on, on the meaning of this. Al Ahmar are the red people. When the ancient Arabs used this term of the white people, they weren't referring to themselves or the reds. They were talking about people from the Byzantine Empire, so like the Greeks, the Romans, white folks, Europeans, and then also the Persians. Al Aswad, or the blacks, the commentators like uh, Qadi Iyad, or Imam al um these great Hadith scholars, they were unanimous that Al Aswad meant Al Arab, that the Arabs themselves were among the blacks. The Arabs, and then also those people who they had contact with, which were the Abyssinians. So ancient Abyssinia made up today what we would call Somaliland, Eritrea, and Ethiopia. And also the Nubian people, which were the people of what we would now call North Sudan and Southern Egypt, in which Aswan was the capital of ancient uh, Nubia uh, before um, before the spread of Islam in, 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 in the land of Nubia. Uh, so this is one. Now, uh, uh, two of the uh, great uh, early Muslims, before I go back to you, because we don't want to take too much time. So we mentioned Bilal. So Bilal the Abyssinian, he's described in Arabic books as Kana Adam Shadidu Udma. So Adam means dark brown like this darker than my, my skin color. I'm not Adam, I would be uh, Adam Muqtadil for those who know Arabic. Uh, Adam Shadid is an intensifier in Arabic language and, and El Udmaz was called the Masdar of Adam. So it means dark brown compounded strongly with dark brown, meaning dark chocolate, <laughs> okay? Like, um, you know, Wesley Snipes or something. <laughs> That's how Bilal was described. Now, overwhelmingly, the fourth caliph of Islam, um, the first cousin of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is Ali ibn Abi Talib. May God be well pleased with him. He's described overwhelmingly in Islamic history books like, like uh, Tariq at uh, Tabari, uh, Ibn al Athir's history book. Uh, Tariq al Khulafa ba Siyuti, he's described as Kana Adam Shadidu Udma. This Arab is described as being chocolate, dark, black, the same color as Bilal, but he's from the Hashemites, he's from the clan of the Prophet, peace be upon him. It doesn't get any more Arab of the Adnani Arabs than Bani Hashem. 
The second is, uh, and there's a famous story about this, I can't get into it because it's too long, but uh, one of the people who came in with the Muslims uh, when they came into Egypt, when Egypt, when Islam first came to Egypt, his name is, is um, uh, Ubada ibn Samet. May Allah be well pleased with him, Ubada ibn Samet. He's from an Arab tribe called uh, Bani Khazraj, and they're from what's called the Qahtani Arabs, because there's two like strands of the Arabs. And he was described as being jet black, right? Jet black, like how you would think of someone from like the Hausa tribe of like Niger, northern Nigeria, or like someone from South Sudan, right? But he was from a, of the early Arabs, of an early Arab tribe, right? So Arabs had a wide spectrum of how they looked in, in times of old. They were predominantly, as uh, Sumer wa Udma, they were predominantly dark. Uh, some of them were black and some of them were lighter in skin color, but majority uh, Arabs back in those days, uh, especially the Qahtani Arabs, whose lineage stems from Yemen and the area of Hadro Mountains, southern Yemen, they were darker people. And Arabs became lighter over time as Islam spread and the men traveled and they, uh, they, uh, they consummated with lighter skinned women, with Armenian women, like Kanye West. <laughs> um, <laughs> Turkish women, Persian women, and Arabs got lighter over time, like how African Americans have gotten lighter over time because of our mixture with European blood and Native American blood. So Arabs have gotten much lighter over time. Um, and, well, I'm talking too long. There's one other thing, El Jahid, who was a, uh, Islamic scholar from the Mu'tazila tradition uh, from a city called Basra. And this was an area that was known of having, uh, he was half Arab and half what would be called Bantu or East African. And he, he made a famous uh, statement in his treatise, Fakhru uh, Sudan al Abidan. He said that the, um, the, the men of Basra preferred women from El Hind, meaning the Indian subcontinent. While the men of Yemen, they preferred Abyssinian women, meaning their shahwa, their desire was strongest for these women. Well, lacking, but the men of Bilal al-Sham of Syria, they prefer women from Qamarum, they prefer white women. So, hence you see the Arabs of Bilal Sham end up becoming lighter over time, and these are the lightest of the Arabs you will see in Syria and Lebanon. This goes back, like, there's history behind this. Anyway, it's a quick history lesson behind the, 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 the Arabs. Uh, but ancient Arabs look more like me than they would look like some of the lighter skinned Arabs in here right now. That, that's, that's basically the point that I'm making. And in West Africa, everyone would think you're Arab anyway. No, they did. <laughs> they did. When I was in the markets, like when I was in Mopti and I was in Bamako, when I sat with Sheikh uh, Mamadou Jallo, and they asked me, Hello, uh, I'm in Masr. You, are you from Egypt? La, and I'm Riki. And I'm Riki, I said, what? Ajib. And they would say back, strange. You're, you're really American? <laughs> no, you're not American. Speaking of West Africa, mm. So we can move up a little bit in time because we're talking about the first generations. Can you give us a little background about how Islam came to West Africa? Because there's a common trope that's put out by Orientalists and even some Pan-Africanists that they claim that people in West Africa came to Islam because they were conquered and enslaved by Arabs. And I think this needs to be clarified and you're the right man to clarify that. And so, yeah, this is something that I discuss in chapter three of the book, and I feel as though it's very interesting. So I, I don't begin the book with this quote, but I'll begin this discussion with this quote. It was the quote from Sheikh Usman Danfodio, who was the founder of the Sokoto Khilafa in northern Nigeria. And when we speak of Khilafas, usually we think of the Abbasids and the Umayyads, but in West Africa there were also Khilafas. And Usman Danfodio established this Khilafa, and he was writing a book, and he said in the book, if we are asked as to whether the blacks, meaning West Africans, 
came to Islam from their own free will or they were conquered. I will quote this earlier scholar, Sheikh Ahmed Baba from Timbuktu who said, West Africans came to Islam of their own free will. And if we look in the history of West Africa, we can see that West Africa was never conquered by any North African tribes or kingdoms. They were never ruled by any Arab tribes or kingdoms, hence why Arabic is not a lingua franca in West Africa when it comes to daily life as it is in other places in the world. And I start the chapter three in the book with an interesting quote from a scholar called Al-Bakri, who was from Andalusia, and he lived in the early um, 11th century. <coughs> So this is at a time before the Almoravids, who were the ones who the Orientalists say conquered uh, West Africa or entered into West Africa forcefully and forcefully converted people to Islam. Al -Bak Hello. I think the battery ran out. Here you go, Bismillah. We'll use this. Al Bakri was a Spanish scholar. At that time, Spain was ruled by the Moors. And he wrote a book called Kitab al-Masalik wal-Mamalik, the book of pathways and kingdoms. And in this book, he describes the most powerful kingdom in West Africa at the time, which was called the Ghana Empire. And so he describes this kingdom and he says, the king is called Basi, and he lives a beautiful life on account of his love and friendship of the Muslims, even though he himself is not Muslim. And he said, in his capital city, Kumbisale, which is on the border of Mali and Mauritania today, they have 12 mosques in the capital city, which the king, who is not Muslim, supports and pays for. He pays the mu'addins and the imams, etc. He said, and one of these mosques is used as a Juma mosque. Not only that, but the king has also built a mosque in his own palace for Muslims who visit him to pray. And even though the king is not Muslim, his ministers, many of them are Muslim, his interpreters, and the person in charge of the treasury is also Muslim. So we can see, imagine the most powerful empire in West Africa at the time. This is before Mansa Musa and the, and the Mali Empire by about 300 years. This is a thousand years ago because he's writing this in the year 1060 or 1050 something. And he's saying that in this West African kingdom, there are already in the capital city 13 mosques. And these mosques are being run by native Africans who had converted to Islam and studied Islam and taken it upon themselves to build masajid and follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Not only that, but he gives the example of how the neighboring kingdom, which he says Malal, but we now know today was Mali, came to Islam. He said the king of that kingdom had a guest who was a scholar who had studied the Quran and the sunnah. At that time, the kingdom was going through a drought and so he was looking for some kind of solution. So they started sacrificing all of their cattle to the different deities that they worshipped and nothing was working. So he came to this Muslim scholar and he said to him, he told him of his problem and the Muslim scholar saw that as an opportunity to give him da'wah. So he said to him, if you can testify that there's no deity that should be worshipped except Allah, God, and you can testify that Muhammad wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him, is his messenger, then I will teach you a prayer that will alleviate the drought from your kingdom. So the king, you know, they worship many gods. So the king said, yeah, let me try this new god, Allah, we'll see how this goes. He took shahada. He started to study the deen with this scholar. He learned how to pray his salah. He learned how to perform zakah and all of these things. And after a while, after the scholar had taught him the deen, then he said, okay, we're going to go and perform this prayer that will save your kingdom. So they went, and Al-Bakri writes this in the book, they climbed to the top of a mountain, they did wudu, and they performed Salatul Istisqa, which is the sunnah prayer of the Prophet Sallallahu for rain. And after they performed it, immediately it started raining. So the king destroyed all of the idols and deities in his kingdom, and he established Islam. And that king was known to have been the great grand uncle of Mansa Musa. And if we look at the story of Mansa Musa, who I'm sure we all know, Mansa Musa himself was the fifth king of the Mali Empire to go on Hajj. He wasn't the first. And he went on Hajj in the year 1327. So we can see that Islam was already well established in West Africa, and it was spreading the same way it spread in Southeast Asia, the same way it spread in the subcontinent. It didn't spread through Arab conquest, but rather it spread through scholarship, through dawah, and through scholars 
providing services to the communities that they were a part of. And not only that, but West Africa had a unique tradition where <clears throat> the scholars of West Africa developed a, a way of dawah where they did not openly call to Islam. The way of dawah, which is called the Suwarian tradition, and is traced back to a scholar called Al-Haji Salim Suwari, was that they believed in providing khidma, service to the local communities. Through what? Through teaching their children, through providing healing and medicine, through providing trade, honest trade, and setting themselves up in different communities and calling people to Islam through their akhlaq, through their manners, through their mannerisms, through the way that they interacted with people. And that served as the most successful means of spreading Islam. Even if we fast forward all the way to the 1800s, we have an American scholar, Edward Blyden, who was a Christian, and he returned to West Africa at the time when many people were, after the slave trade had ended, returning to Africa. A lot of African Americans stayed, but there was a project in places like Sierra Leone and Liberia to return African Americans and Afro-Caribbeans who had been enslaved to Africa. That's how my ancestors went back to Africa from this side of the world. Hence why my grandma's Gambian, but her name is Mary Ann Roberts. And all of my cousins are Jones and Williams, etc. It's because we are liberated uh, <clears throat> in formerly enslaved people. So Edward Blyden writes a book, and he's a Christian, but he writes this book and it's called Islam, Christianity, and the Negro Race. And he compares how Christianity spread and established itself in West Africa to how Islam spread in West Africa. And he presents Islam as the solution to the problems of the black man because he hasn't seen Christianity in that context do the same thing. And so he says, any village that has a Muslim scholar amongst them in West Africa is always seen as more advanced than their neighboring villages because the scholars provide religious services, they provide medical services, they provide, they provide spiritual support to the village, they teach the children, etc., to the point that people themselves in those villages, anytime a Muslim scholar comes, they come to that scholar with all of their problems and all of their issues, and that scholar solves their issues. And so through their establishing of madrasas, through their establishing of businesses, etc., and if we look at the tribes like the Soninke and the Jula who spread Islam throughout West Africa, it was always based on this trade, education, self-sufficiency, and this mentality of supporting and helping people and providing khidmah. And so for over a thousand years, that's how Islam entered into the West African area, and that's how it managed to spread. And it was a combination of scholarship and support and service, spreading love, spreading peace, similar to what we're seeing happening, alhamdulillah, today in Detroit, in certain communities. And alhamdulillah, that's how Islam entered and that's how Islam spread. Thank you. Uh, before I ask the question, just a clarification for terms that some of you may have, uh, have heard. Um, uh, number one, when he used the term dawah, this literally means invitation. So when we are saying dawah, we invite people to the deen, and deen can be loosely translated as religion, but more so it is, uh, some would say, a way of life, but is really the embodiment of faith in God in all aspects of life, pers in personal piety, as well as in social uh, conduct. Uh, the other would be, uh, when we're saying Allah, Allah is the deity, the uh, magnificent uh, creator. Um, and Arabs who are Christian use the word Allah. And if you see an, an Arabic Bible, and I have a copy at home, you'll see that the most used word in that book is Allah. Right? Just like in the Quran, the most used term is Allah. So when you're hearing this, this Allah, don't think of it as some sort of separate God. Right? So this is something very important. I say to the people of the book, right, that let us come to a common word amongst us, that we only worship God and we don't make any partners or associates with him. Right? So this is, this is what we understand. And of course, uh, the most mentioned prophet in the Quran is Moses, or Musa, peace be upon him. 
Um, now, going back, you talked about these great empires. You talked about Mansa Musa, who I think Forbes magazine listed as a, the most wealthy man in, 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 in the history of human civilization. Uh, the Malian Empire you mentioned, uh, the great Ghanaian Empire, uh, the great uh, Sokoto government, and many African Americans or people from the Caribbean have heard of these empires and have no idea that these are Muslims they established it, or even what they call more Spain, these were Muslims. Mm -hmm. So why, it, why do you think that somehow or another Islam has been erased when people hear Moors, they don't think that 100% of the Moors are Muslims. Or the Malian Empire in Mansa Musa, these are, these are Muslims, right? Why is it that you think that this has been um, whitewashed out of the consciousness of, of African people when they hear these, about these empires and these great people? Mm, I would say... <clears throat> The reason behind that goes back to a term that you mentioned earlier, which was Orientalism. And Orientalism was a trend within Western academia in which they kind of repainted history to push certain narratives. So for example, I was uh, recently at the University of Boston, and there was a professor there called Professor Falungon, and he's Senegalese, and he's doing a project to preserve West African Arabic texts. And as you know, my, my, my first degree, my dissertation was on Arabic literature and literacy in West Africa. Because for over a thousand years, as Muslims, as, as West Africa had been Muslim, Muslims in West Africa were using the Arabic language to read and write for their own academia. And not only were they using the Arabic language, but they were using Ajami, which was using the Arabic letters to read and write in their own native languages. So many traditional West African languages were preserved through Islamic education. And so Professor Falungom has this project where he's trying to you know, digitalize all of these Ajami texts, these West African texts that are written in Arabic alphabet. And he said it's a fight for him and something that he's passionate about within the world of academia because he's a PhD, he's a professor at this university. And he said for the longest time, Orientalists have presented West Africa as a solely oral culture, meaning in their classification of civilization, civilization and learning is only based on reading and writing. So for many years, they've said West Africans didn't read or write, their culture is just oral, in order to remove them from the people who contributed to the development of civilization. He said, but we have hundreds of years of texts detailing that Africans were reading and writing, not just in Arabic, but in their own native languages. So that's flipping this Orientalist narrative on their heads. The same way, Orientalists, and specifically French Orientalists, because most of West Africa came under French colonization, they had this theory, which they call Islam Noir, which is black Islam. And how they presented it was they said, West Africans are not real Muslims, like the Muslims we study when we study them in the Orient. So they knew about Imam Ghazali, they knew about Rabi al adawiyah they knew about Ibn Sina, they knew about all of the major scholars of the Middle East. And so because these scholars, they, were, they had their own wars with the Arab world and what they were trying, the narratives they were trying to push on the Arab world, but they wanted to separate what was going on there from what was going on in Africa. And so they said, because these people, Arabic is not their native language, we have this narrative within our academia that black people are deficient in intellect, so they can't reach the same level that these Arabian scholars would have reached. These people, even if they say that they're Muslim, they're not really Muslim, because they can't understand the Quran, they can't understand the Arabic language. So it's black Islam, it's just, you know, they see people praying and they copy the movements, they see people wearing turbans, they copy the dress, but Islam, the same way we see it in the Orient, is not the same way it is here. But alhamdulillah, now, because of the studies and the research of the scholars, we're seeing that that's not the case. We're seeing that, for example, <coughs> Mansa Musa, who we mentioned earlier, who established when he returned from Hajj, and this is something, when it comes to narratives, people don't talk about when they speak about him. They speak about his wealth. They speak about him taking 60,000 people to Hajj. They speak about him uh, spending so much gold in Egypt that 50 years later, Ibn Battuta is saying the economy hasn't recovered from the money that Mansa Musa spent when he was here. 
But they don't mention that when he returns to Mali, he builds a masjid called the Sankore Masjid in Timbuktu. And that masjid goes on to become a university that has at its height 25,000 students and 700,000 manuscripts, making it the biggest library in Africa since the Library of Alexandria. And when they studied these texts, they saw not only Quran and Sunnah and Ahadith, they saw <coughs> literary criticisms of Plato and Aristotle. They saw people discussing the theory that the earth revolves around the sun. At the same time, Galileo was being persecuted for the same idea in Europe. They saw detailed descriptions with diagrams of how to remove a cataract from the eye, eye cataract operations. This area, I'm sure there are many doctors, mashallah, many medical students, mashallah. We've seen the cars in the lot. Huh? <laughs> You'll know how difficult it is to perform an eye cataract removal operation. But 500, 600 years ago in West Africa, they were doing it at this university. Detailed, detailed knowledge that was studied at such a high level, not just in the Arabic language, but in native West African languages. All of this is knowledge that exists, the documents exist, the books exist, but it didn't go with the Orientalist narrative, so they covered it up. But now, alhamdulillah, scholars are unearthing these documents, translating them, and the knowledge is being brought out there. So I say the reason why for a lot of Africans and African Americans, even us in Africa, we don't even realize because, like for example, I'll give you an example. My grandmother was explaining to me during colonization in the Gambia, where she comes from, you are not allowed to speak your native language in school. And if you do, you be, you be punished. They had what they call a dunce cap, which is like a dunce in old English means idiot cap. If you speak your native language, they put the cap on you and make you sit in the corner of the room as a punishment to train them to not speak their known native languages and to only speak English. The only history you know is the history that the English teach you about yourself and not what you can go. Once you're cut off from your own language and your own culture and your own history, and you look at the people who are custodians of this traditional knowledge as being illiterate and being uneducated, you won't go to them for anything. <clears throat> so if we look, for example, in places like Niger, where they say the illiteracy rate is the lowest, the literacy rate is the lowest in West Africa, for example, Niger is mostly Muslim. Everyone can read and write Arabic, so they're 100% literate in Arabic. <laughs> if you ask them to read and write, their names in their native languages using Ajami, Arabic letters, they could do it. But because only 20% or 30% go to the French education system, they say only 20 or 30% can read and write. It's all of these same kind of narratives that cut us off from our own history and culture. So when we study the Moors and we study Mali and we study Songhai, they always minimize the Islam because according to their narrative, they weren't even real Muslims in the first place. When when Mansa Musa was going on Hajj, the Amir of Cairo who hosted him was astounded by his knowledge of Maliki Fiqh and his worship of Allah. And he said he worships Allah as if he can see him, meaning he's reached the stage of Ihsan. He said that about Mansa Musa. So we can see that the traditional narrative that we can find if we approach the text directly and the narratives that they've been fed to us by the academics. Shatta <laughs> Bainahuma. You mentioned a few things that have me uh, thinking. Um, one is the irony that uh, African people who were Muslims that were enslaved were more literate than their French and British slave masters. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's one of the things that strikes me about what you're talking about and how they twisted things. Um, to the African Americans here who aren't Muslims, Know that this is your history, whether you're Muslim or not. And to those of you who are not black in the room who are Muslims, know that this is your Islamic history. So we all have to take ownership and take the proper claim back to what is ours that those who are vested in the system of white supremacy have tried to separate us from our heritage. Right? And, and, and there's something empowering uh, uh, about that. And um, you just made me think about when I was in, um, 
in Gory Island. Mm -hmm. I was there with uh, our beloved brother, Dr. Ware, oh, Bilal sure. Ware, mm -hmm. and also uh, Sheikh uh, Mohammed Mindis. Mm -hmm. uh, he also wrote a book, it's called The Spirit of Black Folks. I suggest you check that out. It's kind of a play off of W.E.B. Du Bois's book, The Souls of Black Folks. It's called The Spirit of Black Folks. Mm -hmm. So you get his book first called Beyond Bilal, then you can go online and get The Spirit of Black Folks, <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> Um, I just spoke to him, he's in Dakar now. Should yeah, 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 yeah. Inshallah. He's living uh, in the Gambia now, as a matter of fact. Yeah, he lives around the corner from me. <laughs> when we went there, and I remember uh, hearing the stories about, um, there's something there called the door of no return. You've been to Gorea, yeah, yeah, right? It's Gore. called the door of no return. And so, Gore Island is just like slightly from Dakar, it's like not far away from there. You take a ferry out there, and then it's there, there's the Atlantic Ocean. And the French called this the door of no return because what they said was is that when any of the African people who were Muslims, they all were Muslims, that left from this port, went to the so-called New World, that they would never return back. And um, I remember uh, looking at the tight quarters of where they would stuff people like sardines before getting on the ship. And I was, I've only, it's like only like, I've only cried like this two times in my adult life. And then one of them was there. And uh, I remember there's a Senegalese brother who came to me afterwards, uh, dreaded up by fall, mm -hmm. you know, dreads and, uh, had some beads around his neck. And he came and he gave me a hug and he said, um, he said, you know, when, when, when the two bob, this is a Wolof term, it means, it means white folks. <laughs> he said when the, but that is, it's not, it doesn't have derogatory meaning, right? It just means white folks. He said when the two bob put our people on these ships, they said the door of no return, they said they would never come back. But he said, alhamdulillah, Praise belongs to God. You're back. The children of Islam have returned. Mm. And that was like a very like cathartic experience mm. uh, for me. And I suggest all of you, if you have the opportunity to go to uh, Senegal and Gambia, uh, for sure. And uh, there's a lot of benefit that can be reached there. Um, how much time do we have left before uh, uh, then? Okay, we'll, we'll take one more question, then maybe we'll have time for Q&A. Okay, so we'll, we'll make this the last one. Um, we've kind of gone and talked about some subjects in your book, but I think if there's one thing that you want to double click on, so to speak, that's in your book that you think is probably the most salient point that you'd want people to take away from your book before they actually buy your book, mm -hmm. uh, God willing, what is that one point? I would say, it goes back to what you were saying earlier, <clears throat> in that the way I've structured the book, it begins with the story of black prophets in the Quran, that's chapter one. Then chapter two deals with the black Sahaba, the black companions of the Prophet Muhammad, the people who peace and blessings be upon him, helped him establish this religion. Then I go into the history of West Africa and how Islam entered West Africa and how Islam spread in West Africa and the different kingdoms that exist there. And West Africa is an interesting case because if we look at most countries in West Africa, they have up to 90% Muslim populations. The lowest you can get in Africa is 40 or 50%. The highest you get, which is most West African countries, is over 90%. So we can assume that most of the people that were taken, as you mentioned, were Muslims. Even if we look, for example, the most popular um, slave narrative that we have in modern history, in modern times, is the story of Kunta Kinte Roots. Kunta Kinte was Muslim, and he came from a very strong Muslim family. I have a video about this where I talk about the fact that his grandfather, when you read the book Roots, was from Mauritania, and he came from the Kunta tribe. That's why he was called Kunta Kinte. And I know people from his family, I have a good friend called Al-Haji Kinte who has shown me 
Qur'ans that his, he's inherited from his great-great-grandfather's handwritten Qur'ans over hundreds of years of age. And, you know, Mukhtar, Kunti, all of these people, they all came from the same family and they were descended from a Sahaba, Uqba bin Nafi. So they had a connection to the Quraysh. I mention in chapter four stories of many of these scholars, many, many of these ulama, many of these even shurafa, people who come from the family of the Prophet wasallam, such as a man who was enslaved in Jamaica called Abu Bakr Sharif. Yeah. And he came from the Sharif family, the Haidara family in Mali. He had traded on the Guinea coast and he was captured and taken to Jamaica. And when they saw him, he used to do all the bookkeeping for his master because his master was illiterate and he could read and write Arabic. And when they discovered he could read and write, they, re they traced him back, he wrote letters to his family and they contacted the Moroccan embassy and they realized that because he's a Sharif, he's a distant cousin of the king of Morocco and they freed him. But there were hundreds, if not thousands of, of people. I mentioned about 30 different people in the book in chapter four as case studies of this phenomenon of ulama, of scholars, of saints, of people who had memorized the entire Quran, people who could read and write and do many amazing things that were captured. But the 30 people I mentioned represent thousands that were not mentioned, who are ancestors of people today. And so when you see, for example, Kunta Kinte's descendant, Alex Haley, also write the autobiography of Malcolm X, and then see how many people that book has brought to Islam, you can see the connection between everything that's going on. And so <clears throat> one of the, in Brazil, in the Bahia revolts, there was a man who had a piece of paper on him, and he revolted and he passed away. And when they opened the piece of paper, they read it, it was a prayer. And it wasn't a prayer for success, it wasn't a prayer for openings, it wasn't a prayer for money or any of the things that people usually write prayers for, but it was the prayer of Ibrahim. Make us, it was the prayer of Abraham and his son Ismail, make us people who submit to you, and from our descendants, a nation of people who submit to you. And so these people were praying for their descendants to return to their original faith. So when you see people like Muhammad Ali, you see people like Malcolm X, you see the hundreds of thousands of people returning to Islam from the African-American community, their ancestors could have been these same people who were the scholars, who were the noble people of their society, who were the royalty, who were praying for their descendants. As we see Kunta Kinte coming from a tribe that's known for scholarship, being captured, and by the time we get to Kizzy and Chicken George, they've forgotten Islam. But yet, his descendant, Alex Haley, brings thousands of people indirectly back to the faith. All of these things, I think that is very important to understand that it's our shared heritage. In the Quran, there's a verse, and it's the verse that Imam Dawood opened this lecture with, where Allah says, he made us into different tribes and nations in order for us to know each other, in order for us to be familiar with each other. And so for non-black Muslims, this is part of our heritage, and this is what connects us. For non-Muslim black people, this is part of our heritage, this is what connects us. And so I wanted to further um, emphasize that in the book, and so that's why I gave it that chronological narrative, because it's all one story. And the chapter five is very important as well, because it deals with the phenomenon of female scholarship within Islam. And I feel as though female scholarship and female contribution is always never spoken about. So for example, in the lecture, I have a picture of the Kaaba. There's a lecture I have called Daughters of Fatima, Female Scholarship in the African Tradition. And I have a picture of Mecca, which is the holiest city in Islam. It's the city that we face five times a day towards to pray. It's the city that we have to visit as Muslims at least once in our lifetime. And so I showed them a picture of the Kaaba, the black cube, which is the center of all worship in Islam, um, which was the temple that was established by Prophet Abraham according to the Islamic tradition. And I say, what do you think of when you see this? And people give different answers. Oh, I think of peace, I think of love, I think of unity, I think of da 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 da. And I say, do any of you, when you look at this, think of a black African woman? I said, because the city of Mecca was established by a black African woman, Hagar, the wife of Abraham, who came from Nubia. And the Prophet Muhammad, in, if we look in the seerah of Ibn Hisham, he tells the people, when Egypt is open for you, be good to those people that you see there 
who have dark skin and curly hair. He said, because they are our relatives through lineage and they are our relatives through marriage. <clears throat> if we think about the fact that the holiest city in Islam was established by a black woman, if we think about the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, who was raised by a black African woman again, if we think about the fact that when he first receives his revelation, the first person to believe in him and comfort him and support him is a woman, if we think about the fact that the Qur'an that we have was preserved by his wife Hafsa, who was a woman, and it's from her copy of the Qur'an that Sayyidina Uthman makes four copies, and all the Qur'ans we have come from those four copies. If we think about the fact that the sunnah of the Prophet, the example of the Prophet, knowing how he ate, how he lived, how he dressed, was preserved most part by his wife Aisha, about whom it was said we can take half of our deen from her, and then we look at West African communities specifically, and we see the important role that female scholarship plays in the West African tradition from the time of Uthman Danfodio and his daughters, Nana Asma and Sayyida Maryam, who wrote books and established communities and networks of scholarship to empower women, all the way to the present day when we see the daughters of Sheikh Ahmed Bamba you know, lending money to the Senegalese government, establishing their own villages and towns, the daughters of Sheikh Ibrahim Nyas, who, you know, established Quran schools that had thousands of children memorize the Quran, established NGOs that built hospitals and schools across West Africa. Sheikh, Sheikh uh, Rukhaya Nyas, who's the daughter of Sheikh Ibrahim, is a consultant for the Jimmy Carter Foundation. I have a picture of her in my, pres in my presentation sitting next to Jimmy Carter. And she never went to any Western university. Everything she learned, she learned in her father's house in the village in Senegal. All of these things, I feel that specifically was something I wanted to bring to the world because there's so many paradigm shifts that we need to have as Muslims when it comes to how we look at black people, when it comes to how we look at women, when it comes to how we look at all of these different people in society who traditionally, we might not think much of them, but in the sight of Allah, they are amazing people. There's a term that we have in, 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 the, in the spiritual tradition in Islam, Mahlun nadrullah fi khalqihi, the place where Allah looks amongst his creation. There are people that society might look down upon, but they are the people that Allah is looking at. The Prophet ﷺ, there's a tradition, and I mention it in one of the, in chapter two, and I'll end the, this, this part here. The Prophet ﷺ was with the Sahaba one day and he said, <coughs> the person that's about to enter the door now is a person that he's one of the 40 people through whom Allah sustains the creation. Allah says in the Quran that he did not create mankind or jinn except to worship him. So the guarantee that this creation will still exist is that there will always be at least 40 people worshiping Allah. And it's through those 40 people that existence itself is sustained. There's other traditions they say it's because of them that it rains, it's because of them, all of these different things happen. He said one of those 40 people is about to enter the masjid. And so the Sahaba are waiting to see who's going to enter. And it was an old Ethiopian man carrying a bowl of water on his head. And he was the man that used to clean the mosque. Nobody knew his name, nobody knew who, where he came from. He wasn't wealthy, he wasn't rich, he wasn't somebody that people would run to outwardly, but spiritually he was one of the 40 highest people that Allah was looking at and sustaining everybody else through. And so there are many of those people amongst us, men and women, who we might not think much of them, but Allah thinks, <laughs> Allah has placed them in a different position. And so we can only understand these things if we shift the paradigm through which we look at reality and we understand these, these, these things. And I, I hope that my book is accepted as uh, a means and a support in order to do that, inshallah. I mean, uh, we'll take you in. <coughs> I want to touch on one point you said, and mm. it relates to a, I had the honor of sharing a panel with uh, the writer Sylvia Njof. Mm, mm, she wrote a book called um, Servants of Allah Servants of Allah uh, 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 African Muslims enslaved in the Americas and she made a, a comment she said that there are many what we would call Shurafa in particular descendants of the Prophet's grandson Hassan ibn Ali that among the African American Afro-Caribbean people they are descendants of the Prophet's grandson who are among the people and 
you don't know who they are and they may not even know who they are mm -hmm. because of what enslavement did in cutting off lineages, but some of them do know and they have hid, they, they hid this lineage. So anyway, as you're talking about people who are akhfa or people who are hidden, just tread lightly when you deal with people because the person that you're looking down on or insulting uh, because of their blackness could be one of God's friends. And if you wage war against them, then you're in trouble with, with God. Mm. So be careful. We'll take uh, Q&A. Well, yeah, cool. uh, can you briefly mention and summarize your findings about black prophets in Islam and some of the prominent black Sahaba that we don't think about mm. as being darker-skinned? Do we have enough time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, essentially, in chapter one, um, I deal with, so I speak about black prophets in the Quran. And this is a very interesting subject, and the reason why I like that chapter is because for most of us, when we hear these things like, Jesus was black, Moses was black, we think of them as YouTube conspiracy theories, or we think of them as, you know what I mean, hotep, Afrocentric, trying to just blackwash everything. Somebody asked me, oh, what do you think about the accusation that you might be blackwashing everything? And I said, I'm not blackwashing anything, maybe I'm wiping off the whitewash that was put on it and showing you the original color. But when we look at, for example, so I ask, I always ask the audience, can you name a black prophet? Most people don't. If they do, they'll say Luqman, for example. They give Luqman as an example, and we have in authentic traditions that he comes from East Africa, so he was undeniably black. And then I go further and I say, okay, but let's go to the tafsir of the verse when Allah says, that Allah is creating a creation, he tells the angels, I'm creating a human being from black mud. So the word that he uses, hama and masnoon, is a very specific term. And we go to the tafasir. And I'm not saying Mustafa Briggs' tafsir or brother L something's tafsir or I'm going to tafsir Jalalain, tafsir Tabari, tafsir Qurtubi. Tafsir Baydawi, Tafsir Baghawi, the classical Tafsir of the Quran, when we look at them, they all say the mud that Adam was created from was either black or it was left to sit until it became black and then Adam create, was created from it. Jauhari spe specifies this in his Tafsir. He says that tradition states that Allah gathered the mud, let it sit until it became black and then he created Adam from it. And in Lisan al-Arab, which is written by Ibn Mandur, he says, when it comes to the word Adam, that the reason why Adam was named Adam was because of his Adam complexion, his black complexion. So the word Adam, Shadid al-Udma, when we go to the dictionaries, Ibn Athir, as you mentioned, and many others, they say Adam <coughs> means darkness of skin color that has no whiteness or redness in it. If somebody's brown, like me, or Imam Dawood, or some of the people in the crowd, they'll call them Asmar, or they'll call them Aswad. He said, but the extreme darkness is Adam, Shadid al-Udma. And then when we look at that term, that term is used to describe Nabi Musa by the Prophet Wasallam. He describes him as being Adam, Shadid al-Udma. And one of the proofs given for this is, Aslug yaduka fi jaybuk takhruj bayda min ghayri su. Put your hand into your pocket and it will come out white. If he was non-white in the first place, if he was white in the first place, if he looked like he did in Ten Commandments that we all grew up watching, that wouldn't have been a miracle. But <laughs> because of the darkness of his skin color, as we see Tabari mention, and Qurtubi, وَكَانَ مُوسَى فِي مَا ذَكَرْ لَنَا آدَم Musa was according to what we have been told by the Prophet ﷺ, he was black. So him being able to change his skin color of his hand was a karama for him. We see in Sahih Bukhari, Ibn Umar, the son of Umar bin al-Khattab, say, مَا قَالَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ لَإِسَى أَحْمَرَ That the Prophet ﷺ never said Isa was light-skinned. Rather, he saw رَجُلُ Adam, a black man, making tawaf of the Kaaba. He asked who he was, and he was told that he was Isa ibn Maryam. All of this is in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Seerah of Ibn Hisham, etc. Then we take that term Adam in, in now. And Dajjal is mentioned as Ahmar uh -huh. in the Hadith. <laughs> then we take that 
and we now look at the descriptions of the Sahaba. We see Ali ibn Abi Talib being described as Adam. We see Abdullah ibn Mas'ud being described as Adam with braided hair. So he was black and he had cane rows and he had braids. Someone that if they came to the masjid today, people would be looking at them funny. <laughs> but he was one of the highest Sahaba in Maqam. We see Sumayyah being described as Adam. We see, and I name many Sahaba and they're named in his book Centering the Black Narrative and many of these other Sahaba that were all black surrounding the Prophet ﷺ, other than Bilal. Because if we look at the message, we only see Bilal and Wahshi as the black Sahaba. When really, all of these other Sahaba who had major roles in the life of the Prophet ﷺ were all also described as being black. Ammar ibn Yasir. Mm -hmm. Many of them. Uh, if, uh, yeah, if we name all of them, we might and go through their stories. It might take a long time. So. By the book, inshallah, the information is there, the dalil is there as well for when people want to deny it. And uh, yeah, alhamdulillah. <clears throat> it can help us to look at and re-look at our tradition and how we interact with each other. Because if we truly follow the... So many of us, we all grow up hearing, yes, an Arab is no better than a non-Arab, black is no better than white, illa bi taqwa. But realistically, a lot of people don't believe that. And because they have this image of all of the Nabiyeen wa Siddiqeen wa Shuhada wa Salihin being light-skinned, when they see a black person, they can't look at them in that way. But if you study this and you realize that the Prophet mentioned the most in the Quran was black, as described by the Prophet Sallallahu that the woman who raised the Prophet Sallallahu was black, that the person who was his closest, his adopted son, and the only Sahaba mentioned by name in the Quran, Zayd, was black, and his son, Osama bin Zayd, was black, and their mother, Sumaya, the first person to attain the status of being a shaheed in Islam, was black, etc., etc., etc. When you see a black person, before you have that internalized prejudice or racism, you will think back to if Sumaya or Ali or all of these Sahaba were to be here with us in our time, how would they be treated? Because they would look the same way as the people that you look down upon or you discriminate. So this is something I hope will help with how we as black people see ourselves within the deen and how people who are non-black see black people within the deen as well, inshallah. <coughs> yes. Um, I just first like to say I, I really enjoyed the historical perspective, um, kind of connecting um, as an African American African history to, you know, the experiences that we have. As an educator, you know, um, teaching in an urban setting, you know, it was a stretch to even teach early African American history. Mm. It's really a stretch to even go beyond this continent and tie it to African history. So, um, you know, I, I just think about how, even as a, a young African American, from this area going to a historical black college. Um, that was my first real education about anything to do with Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, you had all the stereotypes that you heard, but never did we have um, a connection between me as an African American and what happened in Africa. Mm -hmm. And even then in college, and you know, I'm a little seasoned, so that was a <laughs> few moons ago. Um, we, um, I have a couple people here that went to Tuskegee University. There's a prominent statue that um, sits um, in the middle of the campus and it has a, um, a, it's called the veil of ignorance and it's a crouching slave and a veil being lifted. And we all kind of look at that as being, um, you know, something to be proud of, that's to, but what it, uh, the connotation was, the African was ignorant and uh, Booker T. Washington was lifting a veil and you know, we didn't even make that connection until you know we just had a couple of scholars that taught us differently. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make that that observation, and and then to ask you, you know, how can we make that connection for young, not just African Americans, but just people in general? Mm. I feel as though the first step is not relying on the education system to educate us, because for me, growing up. I had, these, I had all of these questions. Like for me, I was amazing in school when I was younger. As I got older, I kind of 
<laughs> shook a bit. But when I was a young student, I loved history class. I loved all of these things. But I was always disturbed at the fact that I never saw myself in the history lessons. And none of it was ever connected to me. I knew everything about Henry VIII and his six wives and divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. And we study, <laughs> I don't know, UK history is different from, I think, how you study history here. Because I don't know anything about the Civil War or the Republic, what is it? The Republic and the, when the North was fighting the South. The Civil War, yeah, I don't know anything about that. That's my wife's domain, she's American. But, <clears throat> um, uh -huh, the Union and the Confederate, I didn't know anything about that, but we studied UK history, but going to Africa and then having questions about my own history, like, okay, I'm West African, but why is my surname Briggs, which is a Welsh surname? Well, I'm West African, but how come I speak English at home? And all of these questions, that's what led me to study African history. But I had to go to the library and look for my own books and go and, on the internet and search and, you know, do my own studies. So the knowledge that we need as a people is not going to be given to us by the education system. So it's about creating alternative, um, not alternative, but supplementary education for our young people. Sunday schools or weekend schools or even just buying them books like, I'm not plugging my book, but buying books like Beyond Bilal, etc and giving them to the youth so that they can read and know that there's more knowledge than what is just in the school. And I think that's always the first, that's always the first step. Um, and then through us studying and realizing that there are other narratives, then we can go on to educate ourselves and educate others. I don't know if you have... Uh, yes, sir. Ah, okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Uh -huh. First of all, yeah, I mean, we thank our Bo Sheikh. May Allah reward you with this uh, clarification. Uh -huh. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put this effort in your balance uh -huh. in the day of your al uh -huh. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. As you know, Allah mentioned in the Quran al-Kareem, uh -huh. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you look at this well, this hall, you will see we have a different color here that way, to make the things beauty. If Allah created everything in one color, we're not going to see the beauty of African, or blackness, or redness, or whatever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, by the end of the ayah, inna fi dhalika la ayatin lil alameen. And then another riwaya, lil alameen. You see, so all these type of things will lead us to something we have to, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, لِتَعَارَفُ mm -hmm. لِتَعَارَفُ Then Allah, if you look at the white people, you will see a lot of blackness in some part of his skin. Mm. So Allah created us like that. So I appreciate you brought a lot of stuff to, sometimes I get so uh, sharp when somebody tell you, look at you black. So you get upset. You should be proud. If somebody tell to the white person, look at you white, white man, they, they, they're happy with that. Why not if somebody tell you you're black, you're not gonna be happy with that. So to, to the story you mentioned, it's mean every nation did something in the part of the history of a human being to develop themselves. Mm -hmm. Even sometimes, even I'm saying, we don't need some time to promote ourselves. Mm -hmm. This is my belief. Mm -hmm. Because as a human being, you don't need to put yourself down. But complex sometimes make the human being, even white or black, to say, I'm under them. Or when the white people and black people are standing, sometimes we think they are better than us or we are better than them. So when you come to this mentality, all the time, you are down. When you see to somebody, I'm better than you, that's mean all the time, your mind tell you, you're not better than him. Mm. So that is something I, will, uh, I learned from what you say. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I really want to read this book sure. and enjoy with it. And I appreciate it. May Allah bless you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Okay, we have any questions from the sister? I'll take a sister, then I'll take a brother. 
I just wanted to ask, um, I do have the book, I did get it earlier today, but I haven't read it yet, and I was just wondering, when um, the Muslims um, came over to America, did you t touch on uh, that part, like uh, when they forgot about Islam and how Islam began to uh, wake up or start yes. growing again? Yes, I did. So chapter four is where I discuss all of that. And um, it's interesting because I begin the story not with the transatlantic slave trade, but before Columbus, because there's evidence that black Muslims were traveling to this side of the world before Christopher Columbus was, because when he arrived, he said he saw boats from West Africa. And he said that the natives brought him cloths similar to the cloths that he saw in West Africa and in North Africa. But then he said, according to his calculations, there's no way that they could have had contact but those calculations is what brought him to the Americas when he was looking for India in the first place. And then I speak about the transatlantic slave trade, and then I speak about the brutality of the transatlantic slave trade and how that led to people forgetting or being made to forget about their history. And then I speak about how that consciousness was reawoken amongst them through scholars like Edward Blyden and his book, Islam, Christianity, and the Negro Race in the 1800s, through movements like the Moorish Science Temple and the Nation of Islam, who I feel all need to be spoken about when we speak about the history of Islam in this country, because they paved the way for us to have Islam as we have it today. Many people try and erase them from the history or downplay them, but why is it that, for example, if we study Sirah, we can talk about the Prophet's ancestors before Islam in Jahiliya and all of the contributions they made so, for example, you look at the story of Sayyidina Abdullah, the father of the Prophet Sallallahu and his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, in Jahiliya. Abdul Muttalib tries to rediscover the well of Zamzam, and he doesn't have enough support from the rest of his tribe. So he makes a promise at the Kaaba. He says, oh Allah, if you give me 10 sons that can help me to redig the well of Zamzam, I'll sacrifice the last son as an offering to you. That is not an Islamic practice, sacrificing your own children. But we speak about it in the Sirah because it's important. Abdullah is then the tenth son. And Ab Abdul Muttalib is supposed to sacrifice him, but he doesn't go through with the sacrifice because he goes to a soothsayer, and the soothsayer tells him, if you sacrifice a hundred camels instead, then you can save your son Abdullah. And this is just to save the Prophet Sallallahu life because if Abdullah sacrificed, then the Prophet ﷺ never reaches us. Soothsaying is forbidden in Islam, but this is before Islam. All of these things that are deemed un-Islamic practices in the Sharia of the Prophet ﷺ were essential to the arrival of the Prophet ﷺ to us because it's through the soothsayer that his father was saved from sacrifice. It's through the, 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 the pledge of Abdul Muttalib that he has his 10 sons, etc. And then we reach the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ brings us to the light of Islam, even though before that they were in Dalal al Mubin, manifest misguidance. But it's that misguidance and the darkness that allows us to know what the light is. So, through that and looking at that, the Prophet ﷺ was even proud of that because he said, I am the son of the two sacrifices. The first sacrifice being Ismail who was saved, and the lineage continued, until Abdullah, who was also saved, and then the Prophet ﷺ was brought to us. So, the same way Moorish Science Temple was here, and the Nation of Islam was here, and the Ahmadiyya was here, and all of these things that led to Islam coming to what it is today, all of those things should be included in the history, and I speak about all of them in, in the book, yeah. You know, interestingly, when I was at uh, National Institutes of Health and doing research there, I met a lot of people who were doing their PhDs from different parts of the world. I met people from Venezuela and uh, Latin America. And they used to tell me in their history books when they're studying that California comes from the caliphate of Harun Rashid, or Caliph Harun, California, Harunia. So that was interesting. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this or done yeah. research on this, but that was interesting to me that Muslims, even before that, were doing missions uh, in America. So we'll take two more I questions, have a inshallah. Comment to make. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. My voice is loud enough. <laughs> um, in relationship to the nation of Islam and those people who accepted that, keep in mind 
and I know some people have some sensitivities about this, but um, the early Orthodox Muslims, mm -hmm. or the early Sunni Muslims, who arrived in America in the early part of the 20th century, that came from greater Syria, when it was still the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. um, and came to places like Detroit. They didn't come to the Black Bomb on the east side of Detroit to give people dawah or to invite them to true Islam. So just take it easy about your judgment about the nation of Islam. The people embraced what came to them which they thought was best. It was something, and they believed it was something better than what they had. Mm -hmm. So when you think about these individuals, think of the journey of Salman al farasi Radwan. Mm -hmm. Salman the Persian, was born into a Zoroastrian family. Mm -hmm. He then came across Christianity and he left Zoroastrianism for something that he felt was superior to Zoroastrianism. Then when he heard about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and then he came to Mecca and embraced Islam, then he left Christianity for that which he felt was afdal or the best, which was Islam. Mm -hmm. And this is the same thing of the, uh, of the likes of Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali, the two most famous American Muslims who came from Christian families, joined the Nation of Islam, and then when they learned better, then they came to the Quran and the Sunnah. Mm -hmm. So just take it easy about your judgments about the Nation of Islam. And I was never part of the Nation of Islam, by the way, but I feel I have a, a debt to pay for those people who made the socio-political space mm -hmm. that... I can publicly be Muslim because quiet is kept in America and in the black American community in particular. It's a nation of Islam that gives us any sort of like um, popularity amongst our people, to be quite frank, that, that legacy. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not us who claim to be Sunnis, right? It's really the, the respect that we get in the black community it comes from those old days uh, in, 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 in the nation, if we were to be honest, mm -hmm. right? So I'm... I, I had to, I felt compelled to say that. Uh, sure. Yes, sir. Can you? Yes. I, I have a history background. I have a, my degree is in history from a historically black college. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad I came here tonight because, well, I got my history uh, degree 30 years ago, and I'm glad you addressed that debate it was when I was there 30 years ago, whether Islam came as a conquering force mm -hmm. or in the method in which you mm -hmm. described. And it's definitely going to get me to go back and open up some books and do more research, mm -hmm. perhaps with your book, because pretty much it was taught one way. Mm -hmm. And now, can I add something to that? Sure. It's also interesting that now we're having books translated from Arabic that were written by West Africans in that period in order for us to understand what was happening yeah. at that time. So, for example, there's books like Tariq al-Sudan or Tariq al-Fatash, which were written in the 1400s by West African scholars that they detail how the history of their own kingdoms and how Islam entered into those kingdoms. There's the Kano Chronicles as well, which details the history of the Kano Emirate, which goes back a thousand years. That's a book written by West Africans in West Africa, and they detail how Islam came to Kano, etc. So during the ancient, the old times, people hadn't had access to those materials, so they couldn't translate them and put them in the books that they were using to teach in the academic institutions. But now that we have access to these materials as primary sources, we can hear from the Africans themselves at the time how they came to Islam rather than how the neo-colonialists and the orientalists tell us we came to Islam. So I feel like that's... But yeah, sorry to, dis to interrupt oh, you. No, okay. Yeah, go ahead. That's, that's, more, that's, more of what that's more of what I want, you know. Keep it coming. <laughs> uh, now, I teach in the city of Detroit, you mm -hmm. know, I teach middle school kids and I teach them history. I have been teaching this year, we began with ancient history. Uh, I made sure I taught them about Jesus Christ, Moses, uh, uh, Muhammad, uh, Buddha, just, every, uh, you know, objectively, mm -hmm. not from my own perspective, so to speak. Um, now, undeniably, 
you know, I, I teach to Christian children, most of them, all of them pretty much. Undeniably, I tell them that the European uh, slave traders who participated in the Atlantic slave trade were Christian mm -hmm. and European. That's mm -hmm. undeniable. Mm -hmm. And that as African Americans, now African Americans, we came here, Christianity was pretty much forced on us. It was not a religion that we chose. But I still take history and teach it, whether it comes down for me or against me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, when those slave traders went over to the west coast of Africa, what religion did the people who traded with those mm -hmm. European Christian slave traders what role, if any, mm -hmm. did the Islamic religion play mm -hmm. in the Atlantic slave trade? Mm -hmm. And I think that may open up as to why we may have some of that misconceptions mm -hmm. about how Islam spread in mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. Did the Islamic rulers or people participate in the Atlantic slave trade? Mm -hmm. Now, from my research, and like I said, it's a new day and age, yeah, yeah. and we have new people telling the narrative mm -hmm. that 15 million Africans were trafficked between Christian and Muslims. Mm -hmm. So I want to know what is your opinion on that, yeah. or facts of that? Yeah, yeah, no, the fact of the matter is many of them were Muslim. Many of them were also non-Muslim. Many of them were people who practiced traditional African religions. Everybody at that time was involved in the transatlantic slave trade, which is an unfortunate reality. But we have to look at it as the slave trade at that time in within Africa was never racialized the same way it was in this part of the world. So it wasn't that people were targeting black people to make them slaves but it was rather inter-tribal wars that were happening between different ethnicities and different kingdoms that led them to capture people from the other side and then sell them to the Europeans. And a lot of the time, it was Europeans that were prompting them to do that. So for example, we see, and a lot of the time as well, unfortunately, Muslims were more victim to it than non-Muslims. Than non so this narrative that, oh, it was the Muslims because slavery was a part of their religion that they were enslaving others, that's not usually the case. We see, for example, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, one of the greatest scholars of Senegal. He speaks about his younger sister being kidnapped by slave traders and sold to Europeans, and she never returns. We see, for example, Al-Mami Abdul Qadir Khan, who was a king of the Fulani Empire in Guinea and Senegal. He was the first West African to make the practice of slavery illegal in his kingdom and to fight against the transatlantic slave trade. Why does this happen? Because non-Muslim tribes knew that if you go to a Quranic school, you can find 100, 200, 300 children there. If you go to a mosque, you can find people. So they were raiding Quranic schools. They were raiding Muslim territories. They were raiding all of these places where they knew Muslims would congregate in order to capture them and sell them into slavery to get benefits from the Europeans. The Muslims then were reacting, going to war with these people, and then if they captured people, they were selling them to Europeans too. So it was something that unfortunately affected everybody in that society. But within that society, the only people that took an active stance against the transatlantic slave trade as well were also Muslims. So we see Amami Abdul Qadir Khan banning slavery. We see the ulama banning slavery. We see all of these things happening within the Muslim community as well. But I would say the fact of the matter is everybody was involved but we can't blame it on Islam the way people try and portray it because it was part of the culture at the time. When you have prisoners of war, you sell them. It wasn't, we're gonna have a plantation and bring these people here to work for us for free. It was, we're trying to get rid of our enemies the best way we know how, and these people wanna buy them from us, so we'll give them to them. Do you wanna add anything? Yes, sir. All right, we'll take one last question. Assalamu alaikum. 
quick question. Jazakallah. Thank you very much for the very, very nice conversation. Uh, Beautiful evening. Shukla. Uh, my question is, and I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit of the things you said, uh-huh. that uh, there are biases against black people, uh-huh. the colored people, in almost all cultures. Mm-hmm. And as I view them personally, these are just the crutches, you know, we all grow up with. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult for us to get rid of them uh, mm-hmm. individually. Mm-hmm. So my, my question to you is, I mean, Allah created all of us same, you know, as he's going to judge, he's the best judge. Mm-hmm. Nobody. We should be, inshallah, judged on our character, what we did and everything. Mm-hmm. But what can be done to address this thing that not only in America, everywhere, these biases are kind of, how should I say it, eradicated or, you know, mm-hmm. thank you. Yeah, for me, everybody has their own um, individual solutions. For me, I believe the solution was education. If you can educate people and teach them better, if they know better, they should be able to do better. And so that's the reason why in the effort, I mean, it's going to be impossible to turn every person who has anti-black sentiment in the world into people who don't. But we can do small efforts. So when I began, for example, my lecture series, I didn't realize that I'd be able to lecture in all of these different places. When I decided to make it a book, I didn't realize that the book would reach where it reached. But hopefully, you know, each one can teach one. If you have me as one person, I was able to affect 100 people or 1,000 people or provide them with new information that has changed their perspective, those 1,000 people can go on to affect 100 more people. By the end of that, that's 100,000 people affected by the knowledge. And then those 100,000 can continue to spread the message. And eventually, over time, we can see a shift in perspectives and we can see a shift in things. And I'm seeing it already where people are coming and one of the most touching things I'm seeing is people who are coming to buy the books and if I say who do I sign it to, they say, oh, I want to give it to my son or I want to give it to my daughter. Because for many of us growing up, we didn't have access to this knowledge or this information. There were no books like Blackness in Islam and Centering the Black Narrative for us as young people trying to find ourselves. There were no books like Beyond Bilal. But now there's a whole new generation of children who grew up with access to this information and even earlier age. And so it will shape the way they think so that possibly in the future, this new generation coming won't grow up with the same biases and prejudices that we have today. So yeah, for me, my solution is education. I have some additions to add on to that. Uh, Before you do that real quick, just want to thank Sheikh uh, Taq and Sheikh Abdul Karim Yahya, and then I'm going to leave it to you for closing remarks. So in regards to your question regarding racism, and this may sound novel to some of you all, but when we're talking about this issue of racism, and anti-black racism in particular, that behind all physical manifestations are metaphysical realities. So really, it's an issue of information, but also it has to be an issue of treating diseased hearts, because we're talking about spiritual diseases. Kibr is the most dangerous spiritual disease that undergirds racism. Is what Iblis said about when he didn't bow to Adam, right? Kibr is number one. El Hasid is another. Envy. Why? Because Iblis had Hasid towards Adam السلام, because he felt that he was, had a position that he thought that he was more deserving of, so he wanted to be stripped away from Adam because he thought he was more deserving. This is a spiritual disease that undergirds racism as well. Also, with information or knowledge is also the issue of socialization, right? In which the Prophet ﷺ had intentional mu'akhat, where he socialized and had people of different tribal backgrounds that were paired off together. So it means that we have to strive to sacrifice some time drive past these invisible walls that we have like that separates Oakland County from Wayne County. 
that separates the suburbs from the urban areas, that separates lighter skinned people from darker skinned people, right? So that we can connect uh, a sudor, the sudor from hearts to hearts of living, breathing human beings, right? So books are important. Information is important, but I think there's a level also of socialization. This is part of the sunnah. The treating of these spiritual maladies, why you zakki him, this is part of the Prophet Sallallahu mission, is to purify the people of their, uh, of, of these inner issues. So, but we have to look at it as a spiritual issue firstly. And I also say this to those people who are involved in community organizing and racial justice. Racism can't be legislated nor adjudicated away because laws can't undo issues inside the heart. And this has been part of the problem of so-called racial justice movements and things going on. They think that by marching and passing laws, getting court cases, that's gonna solve the problem. All those are band-aids. And that's why racism in America really hasn't changed that much from 50 years ago, right? Societally speaking, it really hasn't. Right, so because we're, 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 we're not using the right remedies, right? And, it's, and, and this might sound like a, a slogan, but Islam has a solution. <laughs> really, with that I'll stop, and we're gonna, we're gonna pray first and then come back and do the book signing or the book selling. Anything. I'm a guest. <laughs> I wouldn't sell the book in the prayer hall. Yeah, no, it's in the book in the hall, inshallah. Where's the. Give the Sheikh Ishaq for the dua. We'll do it uh, after the salah. Yeah, subhanakallah, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, Imam Dawu. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Mustafa. Jazakallah khair for everyone for coming out. We're going to go pray. We're going to have a dua after prayer. And then we'll have the book signing in the mezzanine uh, outside the prayer hall, inshallah.